I've been um, amazed uh, all, all my adult life, really, <clears throat> by the profound reverence for the state that people in our time have, including me. I mean, it's something I was raised in, you might say. I come from a home where I, I had many blessings, and um, one of... One of uh, Part, little parts of my legacy that was not a blessing was my parents' reverence for Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, it was a democratic home, but it was uh, at least democratic in a different way from today's Democrats. Uh, in those days, being a Democrat meant kissing babies, not aborting them. And the, um, the things that were to come were totally unforeseen then. And so the state could be seen in a way as benign. It had a reputation for protecting us from all sorts of things. It was supposedly our salvation from depression, fascism, and then communism. And I think in a way the state faces a crisis of legitimacy now because there are no obvious monsters it can point to. That the state itself has become the wolf at the door to, uh, in a way that's become obvious to more and more people. Or at least, let's say, it's become a guard dog that we no longer need. There's no more wolf, and the dog keeps eating us out of house and home and biting the children. So people are starting to wonder a little bit, which I think is, uh, is very healthy. The trouble is that we're all raised in this faith. And it is an orthodoxy that doesn't call itself an orthodoxy and isn't recognized as an orthodoxy. In fact, it hates the idea of orthodoxy. But orthodoxy simply means straight opinion, thinking straight, or as, as you might say, eliminating the inessentials. To me, education means in great part depth perception. It means sorting things out. It means the capacity to be fully educated is to have the capacity to sort things out, to separate the, the essential from the inessential, the central from the marginal, the important from the merely urgent. Now, in this century, according to a recent study of the totalitarian states of our time by, I think, Professor Hummel at the University of Hawaii. Uh, the modern state has killed about 192 million people. It's going to have to do a lot of good to atone for that. In fact, I don't quite see how it's possible. That's 192 million of their own subjects. That doesn't count wars. That, that doesn't count people they kill in, uh, across the border. It means within their own borders. Now, it seems to me that with this track record, it should be obvious that to use the state as the instrument of human betterment is like using a tiger to pull a plow. You might be able to get it to do it a little bit, but is it worth the attempt? Now, it seems pretty obviously not when you step back from it. But stepping back is the whole problem. I like to tell a story told by my old friend Hugh Kenner, the great literary critic, who asked uh, a museum curator once how they discovered that the Etruscan horse at the Museum of Modern Art, or the Mo Metropolitan Museum of Art, rather, was a fake. And she said, well, we carbon dated it. He said, yes, yes, I know that. But why did you carbon date it? What made you suspicious? She said, well, whoever forged that horse, endowed it with every Etruscan mannerism he could see, and every 19th century mannerism he couldn't see. But in the 19th century, nobody else could see the 19th century style either because the style of your own time is always invisible. But gradually, the 19th century style worked its way up to visibility. It began to look quaint, and some sharp critical eye looked at that horse and said, it looks, looks rather Victorian, really. And they checked, and sure enough, 
it was a 19th century forgery. Well, the only way to avoid being sucked into the style of your time, I think, is to try to stay behind the times. You can't really get ahead of your time. You can't leap into the future. But you can lag a little bit. And we ought to be looking for the permanent things. And in a way, the permanent things, the eternal things, are the essential things. Now, to say the state should control education, well, George Washington said, state isn't reason, it isn't persuasion, it's force. It's all it is. Now, it may have its justifications. There can't be very many of them. But the idea that it's a comprehensive force for human improvement is about the craziest heresy I can imagine. The state may be justified as, as a protector against force, that is, a, a counterforce against aggressive force. That's the only justification I can really imagine for it. But that's not what believers in the state believe. They believe the state can do anything. Listen to Bill Clinton. There's a true believer in the modern state. He's not a, a totalitarian in the sense that we usually think of it. He simply instinctively reaches for a government solution to every problem. That's his pragmatic faith. I mean, it is quite pragmatic. And like most pragmatic approaches, it doesn't work. Uh, we have people who don't have the skills to run a small business trying to run a continent. And, I mean, what, where does it say that the skills needed to win political office endow you with the skills to supervise education, commerce, transportation, labor, defense, and everything else. It's an amazing non sequitur. But that is the faith of our time and the style of our time. Always propose a political solution to anything that can be called a problem, a social problem or a national problem. To say the state should control education is like saying that the army should raise our children. And Oddly enough, that's almost what the D.C. schools are now doing. They've chosen the general to reform the school system. They're talking today, this very morning, about marching orders for teachers and such. And it actually may be an improvement. Now, my main point is, it was put once and for all by G.K. Chesterton. The main fact about education is there's no such thing. You, what is education? It means teaching. Well, teaching what? Teaching is a transitive verb. I teach. It's strange people say that now. They didn't used to say it. Teach has become an intransitive verb. That's how you know it's been perverted. <laughs> now, there are two reasons why putting the state in control of children's minds is wrong and I would say even monstrous. First, we want education to be free. That is, we want it to be a parental prerogative. That's the essential thing. That's the thing that must always be the case under any circumstances. The other thing is not essential, but nowadays it's highly prudential. We want education to be decentralized and independent of the state simply because the forces of centralization are so overwhelming. The, um, the state has usurped the place of both parent and priest, and has done this in a subtle way. We now have, of course, in America, what we call the separation of church and state, though it's not that. It's the usurpation of the church's place by the state. The separation of church and state has come to mean that when the state chooses to move in, the church must move out. That is, the public keeps crowding out the private, in, to put it in very general terms. And this is what we've come to accept. What we call civil rights, for example, and civil liberties are basically governmental usurpations of the rights of privacy and association and property. All these things that used to be taken for granted have now become suspect as they say, suspect categories. In education, the state professes to be too modest to teach religion. 
Therefore, the child is not only taught no religion, but isn't even taught that religion may be important. Well, think of that. If you don't believe in God, you'll have no complaint with that, perhaps. But if you do believe in God, something's missing here. I mean, if you believe in God, and especially if you're Christian, then the essence of education must be the transmission of Christianity. Christian truth is what must be taught. The child's soul is at stake. But of course now it's become one of our secular truths that there are no souls. Remember Anatole France's uh, famous prayer, the agnostics prayer, O oh God, if there is a God, save my soul if I have a soul. Now, uh, our schools don't even teach the if. They simply ignore the whole subject. It's off limits. Now, is that modesty or arrogance? It's supposed to be modesty. The state is supposed to be saying, well, we have no competence in religion. But it's subtly saying, also, neither do you. There's no such thing as competence in religion. If you eliminate religion from education, you've got to trivialize either religion or education. And since the educators don't want to trivialize themselves, they implicitly and sometimes explicitly trivialize religion. I had a teacher when I became a, a convert to Catholicism in my teens. In ninth grade, I had a teacher who took me aside. He wasn't even my teacher. He was just a friendly teacher who of very liberal inclinations and a very lovable man, I must say. A great teacher. He took me aside during one of his classes. He neglected the class and took me in a back room for an hour to tell me everything that was wrong with the Catholic Church and why I shouldn't join it. My gosh, that's refreshing to think of that. He actually took the subject seriously. I mean, he tried to reason about it. Even attacking it is so much better than ignoring it. To think about it, to take the subject seriously. Well, the secularist educator infers from the separation of church and state that the church is evil and the state is good. That's the working assumption behind most modern public education. The, uh, and the teachers feel basically if, if religion were that important, we'd be teaching it, wouldn't we? We're not teaching it, so it must not be very important. Now, the, it's, it's obvious if you're a Christian, or even if you can imagine a Christian point of view or any religious point of view, it's obvious why religion should be private, why it shouldn't be left to the state. But there's that second reason I mentioned, the prudential reason I'll, I'll discuss just, to, just briefly here. Education, when perverted, turns every child into a little, what you might call, not a citizen, but a state unit. That's all it is. Uh, one millionth of the state so to speak. Notice that communism was never against education. Not at all. On the contrary, it combined two strange, strangely incompatible things, or at least things the liberal mind supposes to be incompatible, namely universal literacy and total censorship. Lenin is quoted as saying that the purpose of teaching everyone to read is not to create a new intelligentsia, far from it, but to enable everyone to read our directives. <laughs> so schools can be a marvelous device for creating a society that is uniform without being truly orthodox. A state monopoly in education, or even a state privilege in education, assists the ultimate purpose of centralization and turning all children into little units of the state. In fact, I think to some extent that's what it did to me, perhaps to some of you or most of you, in the sense that you had to fight your way out of that mindset. It probably took an active struggle, may still take an active mental struggle, not to slip back in to the mindset of the state believer so, uh, at any rate, uh, after a century of terror, I repeat, expecting 
The state to improve the human condition is like expecting that tiger to pull your plow. It isn't going to work for very long. Thank you.